Wayside with Minjika, Keba Malamangil, Banabun Yalambu Wanangeri Balak Nir and Amaga Gil Bill Nicholson. It's not just a broad welcome, it's welcoming you for a purpose. And the purpose I'm explaining now is a, is a gathering here to talk about the very important um, you know, social issues and healing of people. I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Boonwurrung and Wurundjeri Woiwurrung peoples of the Kulin Nation. We pay our respects to elders past and present and note that sovereignty has never been ceded. We recognise that this land sings with 60,000 years of living culture and acknowledge that modern history is scarred by massacres, violent dispossession of land and the trauma of the stolen generation. When we stop to acknowledge the violence of colonialism in Australia and name systemic racism as the source of the violence experienced by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, we take a small step towards creating a more equitable world. This always was and always will be Aboriginal land. What is the situation in the country in general, in Australia? Well, there's a lot of progress. Our capital has been the most progressive over the last two or three years. That involves legislation to decriminalise drug use, and that is going ahead this year. They've legalised cannabis, possession of cannabis. They've had pill testing programs at festivals. We've had medical cannabis in Australia for quite some time, which has worked quite well. We've had a supervised and decking room set up in 2018 in a suburb not far from here, where there was, uh, I guess, high prevalence overdoses and a lot of public injecting. And that room has been uh, outstanding in terms of its achievements. We've had a 50% reduction in overdose deaths in that um, area. We've had significant change in public injecting. The injecting room, if they want access, they'll go through there, but they can just come in and access regular needle and syringe services or access the consulting site. We've had over 6,000 separate individuals register to use the service, and there's almost 400,000 visits to the service in that time. So we've had more than 6,000 overdoses. This is the injecting zone. So it's got the capacity for 20 people to inject simultaneously. You get your syringe, a spoon, water and a tourniquet. 95% of the visits to the room are to inject heroin, sometimes in combination with other things, and only about 3% methamphetamines. I really like this room because I, I know I'll come out and I can safely use whatever my substance of choice is on the day. And uh, this is like one of the few places where I feel welcomed and not judged and not ostracized for what I do. I just feel safe here. I know that I'm not going to die in the alleyway. How would you feel about the service, the drugs actually being prescribed and supplied here rather than having to buy on the street corner? That would make it the perfect service. That, 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 that'd be a dream. It's called a vein finder. It kind of can show up the, the veins more easily. Well, I think this is probably our most informal area and it's also the place we really get to build up relationship and rapport with people. We can actually do a lot of our referral work, our psychosocial work and also engaging with people to check in on, on how they are. They so can get a very quick rapid result within 60 minutes for hepatitis C RNA, so indicating current hepatitis C infection. You can obviously get treatment prescribed very quickly and then clients started on treatment very quickly as well. Do you have a range of services from primary care, the hepatitis testing you've seen, opiate dependence treatment, oral health care in conjunction with a uh, oral health service, legal support, drug treatment, uh, wound care, sexually transmitted infections, mental health support. There's a range of services that we provide in this space here. To see the holistic range of services you have here, uh, supporting the most vulnerable in the community is really heartwarming. And to think that it's all paid for by the public purse is, is particularly uh, encouraging. And clearly there's a need for much more of it, uh, not only in this city and state, but across Australia. My own country has nothing like this. We have a thousand people from 70 to 80 countries around the world. There's um, a huge amount of energy and the research being presented is incredible. The activism we're hearing about, the personal stories, the peer leadership. It's really good to run into people that I haven't seen for a number of years and good to Good to connect, especially after Melbourne's lockdowns, gives us opportunity to rebuild and regain momentum that uh, felt sorely lost. In Japan, stigma against people who use drugs is deep-rooted. 
almost all people report to police once they know a person uses drugs, even in hospitals, social welfare offices, schools, or shelters. So no one talks about their drug use when they need support, or they just give it up. So that's why I started Harm Reduction Tokyo. So we provide psychosocial support to survive. So through chat services, so you can talk freely and safely. And in the previous year, we chat more than 2,000 times and met over 200 people who use drugs. We will not stop doing this until the society changes. What is the general harm reduction situation in China? Well, uh, 10 years ago, it was uh, still pretty good. But more recently, especially after the start of COVID, the Chinese uh, services have uh, deteriorated. Methadone program is still ongoing. But uh, other services, harm reduction services, such as uh, needle exchange, only provided as a lip service. In Thailand, you know about uh, drugs. Is illegal. Provide the needles is illegal too. Government are not provide the needles for our drug users. Right now, just civil society provide. We need more funding and we need more organization to do for harm reduction too. Often governments talk about, oh, we take a health approach to drug use. Um, we have drug rehab programs for people but you need to look behind those kind of nice sounding words to see what the reality is. And often it's still, it, it is almost always very punitive still. Yeah. The biggest thing that the government could do probably is just to leave people alone. And I think this is essentially the kind of the, the biggest challenge at the moment. In the words of a great Australian, Michael Kirby, the state should stay out of the bedroom. What are the special needs of women who use drugs in Kenya? Many women who use drugs are homeless and they are homeless together with their children. We have established low threshold shelters that are managed by women who use drugs at the community level. These shelters are near the drug using sites which can easily be accessible to the women. Can you talk about the advocacy toolkit you developed with the network? We can train using this toolkit harm reduction service providers so that when women who use drugs and gender diverse people who use drugs, when they come for harm reduction services, can they also access sexual and reproductive health services? And if they cannot access contraceptives, let's say they cannot even access safe abortion, they cannot access information on perinatal and newborn care in harm reduction services, where else would they access it? A lot of us just are starting to realize how important mental health is and actually addressing it, not just for the people that we service or the people that we work with, but also for the actual workers themselves. The overarching theme of the conference, of course, is strength and solidarity. Uh, for me as a trans person, I find this to be a really important message. The fact that I have multiple intersecting identities, both of which are marginalized as a person who uses drugs and as a trans woman, really highlights how we need to have solidarity across different social justice movements. So if you would like to send a message to these professionals in their suits, what would it be? If you just sort of like stopped and cleared your mind of all oh, these myths, misconceptions that you've, that we all learn throughout our whole lives because that's what's like bombarded to us about like who drug users are and what they're like. If you just try and put that aside, look at me as a person, listen to me and my experiences. Maybe you learn something and you learn that we're not scary, we're just fucking people like you and me. And like drug use is probably the least interesting thing about me, actually, <laughs> yeah. What I really like at the conference uh, this year is uh, the attention for uh, diversion of funds away from drug control towards uh, health programs. That's something that I take home as a message, like, yeah, we really need to bring our game better to push for that agenda in the Netherlands. Our final award for the evening is the International Rolleston Award. Now, we had an, in an incredible array of nominations for this, but the absolutely outstanding one was the nomination for the Ukrainian activists, organizations and service providers maintaining and continuing services throughout the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So please come up. We are back to understanding of harm reduction as a comprehensive approach, which include evacuation of people from bombing shelters, providing shelters, providing food, and sleeping bags for kids and families. 
And that's all done by nurses, doctors, harm reduction activists in the, under the bombing, under missile attacks. What we're doing now from the Latin American network of people who use drugs is we're trying to push further to talk about the stimulants, harm reduction, but mainly talk about human rights to see if the, um, the international funders start working on reducing the stigma and discrimination instead of only focusing on injecting drug use. That definitely it's important, but it's an issue that you mostly see in Colombia or Mexico. What's really innovative in, in, from the international perspective is the Safer Supply pro Program in Canada. Can you explain to people who don't know about what is it? For the most part, it's very medicalized safe supply. So it is run through health clinics to engage people to get a prescribed supply of their substances. There is a program running in BC that is being run through a drug user group where they are purchasing substances, testing them, repackaging them, and um, giving them out to people that use substances in the community, but that's a very unique experience there. You were speaking, I think, yesterday about decriminalization and how to do it in an adequate way. Can you explain that? Yeah, you know, decriminalization is a major intervention that we're pushing now, and part of it is recognizing that criminalization is an inappropriate response to drugs. One of the things that we fear in doing decriminalization is moving it from the criminal the criminal punishment system and then letting another system take over that space and continue to criminalize people, continue to stigmatize people, to continue to take up all the resources that are necessary to give to communities. The things that I think will help turn the tide are solutions that have to happen way upstream. How, how do you prevent someone from being traumatized in the first place? How do we eliminate poverty, right? How do we repair the harms caused by other structural violence, like racism and white supremacy? Harm reduction, it helps a, a small portion of the folks who need these kinds of services who manage to find us, right? Harm reduction isn't in every corner of at least the US the way it should be. And even if it were, it still wouldn't be enough. There are too many people hurting and in pain. And I'm not suggesting that the only folks who use drugs are ones who are hurting in pain. I'm not suggesting that at all. But for those who are, um, help often doesn't come soon enough. Do you think these conferences can make a change? We are making changes now in the ideas that we're bringing forward, what we're sharing, but the actions, right? Change is not just a word. It's, it's an action, it's a, it's a place to be. It is how you eat, how you sleep, how you walk, how you wake up. And being here and taking time from being on the field and sharing and going back with truths and ideas and collaborations and talking about real things. How do you protest? How do you impact? How do you write laws? How do you cheat? How do you, how do you make things happen? This is important. That is change. So yes.